So I, uh, this, in the last couple of weeks, I read a, a great article from Dr. Michael Kruger. He's the uh, president of RTS Charlotte, Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. And he wrote an article that had, uh, I think the title of it was uh, Five Misconceptions About Christmas. And the point of the article was uh, so much of what we believe or know or take for granted in the Christmas story and the Christmas season, uh, a lot of it's myth. A lot of it's just fable, fantasy. We've absorbed details from you know, any number of things that aren't actually in the Bible. And so I thought what we would do this morning, or this evening, that's one. I told the folks down here, let's count how many times I say morning, right, in the sermon. So, um, I thought what we would do this evening, especially since we have the children with us, that we're going to start with a game, okay? Uh, we're big Jeopardy fans in my house, especially one of my sons. Uh, is a huge Jeopardy fan, and so I thought we would start with the game, and I'm going to give you questions, and you're going to yell out the answers, uh, what you think is the right answer, and then we'll see how much of what you know about Christmas is fact or fiction, okay? Got that? All right, here we go. First question. The Bible tells us Mary traveled to Bethlehem by A, riding her electric scooter, (laughs) B, riding a donkey while Joseph walked, C, walking or D, none of the above. Got that? A is riding her electric scooter. B is riding a donkey while Joseph walks. C is walking. D is none of the above. Ready? Ready, set, what is it? D. Ah, it is D, none of the above, because the Bible doesn't actually tell us how she got to Bethlehem, okay? But we always see pictures of her riding on the donkey well, you know, Joseph Walt, but who knows? Okay, here's another one. True or false? We celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th because the early Christian church co-opted and redeemed an existing pagan holiday. How many of you have heard that before? Okay, lots of you. Okay. True or false? Ready? True. A lot of trues. False. <laughs> Absolutely false. Right. So, uh, actually, uh, early church... Uh, folks believed that Jesus was uh, crucified, and rightly so. They believed that he was crucified on March 25th. And so for various reasons, they believe he was also conceived on March 25th. You go nine months from March 25th, what do you end up at? Well, you all are real math geniuses in here, okay? <laughs> right, December 25th, that's right. And the reason why I think March 25th, and by the way, just as a side fact, is there's pretty good uh, reason to believe that John the Baptist was conceived in September. And if you go nine months or six months, and we know that Jesus was six months after John the Baptist, that's March. So there's a couple of little clues in Scripture that make people go, hmm, okay, there we go. Uh, so anyway, there you go. It's false. It, it has nothing to do with pagan holiday. That's, that's untrue. That's a recent development. Here's a good one. This is really, this is too easy. Uh, Jesus, children, you ready for this one? This, one's, this one I put in here just for you. Jesus was born in A, a stable, B, hospital, C, a house, or D, none of the above. A is a stable, B is a hospital, C is a house, D is none of the above. Only children can answer. Ready, children? One, two, three, what was it? A. C, house. Okay, this is a good one. You know how the, we even just read in Luke, he was, he, they, there was no room in the what? In. Okay, the Greek word for in there is the only place in Luke it's translated in. Everywhere else it's translated guest room. Okay, and so Dr. Kruger rightly points out that in that time, homes had a guest room, and they had another room attached, like we might call a one-car garage. That's where they kept the animals, and their little home. They didn't have like, you know, Old West stables and barns out back. No, it was like attached to the house. And so uh, literally he says, and I gave you the quote, just so, because this is really cool. Uh, Maybe I didn't give you the quote. It's not up here. Uh, And here we go. It it seems likely then that Mary gave birth to Jesus while they were staying at the home of Joseph's relatives in Bethlehem. But the room in which they stayed, likely a tight guest room or hastily added chamber, couldn't accommodate a birth. So Mary had to give birth in the larger family room and lay Jesus in the nearby manger, okay? That word in, everywhere else in the the New Testament is guest room. In fact, there is another word used in the New Testament, Greek word, that's translated in, and that's not what's used here. So there we go. Interesting. 
This one, again, to me, this one's for children, okay? How many wise men came from the east with gifts for Jesus? A, four, B, three, C, at least two, D, none of the above, okay? Children, ready? A, four, B, three, C, at least two, D, none of the above. What is it? Uh, that was not a children's voice I just heard over here. <laughs> if it is, puberty came really early. <laughs> it is C, at least two. The Bible doesn't say three, doesn't give us a number. It does give us plural. It says they came from the east, so we know there's at least two. Why do you think we say three? A lot of people think three. Because of the gifts, frankincense, myrrh, and so they think, okay, there's three. But there could have been four, and one of them was the original Scrooge and didn't bring a gift. We don't know, <laughs> right? But it's at least two, okay? Speaking of myrrh, this is for everybody. The Magi brought gifts, including myrrh. What is myrrh? Is it A, a precious jewel, B, ancient money, C, a cooking spice, or D, a burial spice? Okay, A, B, or C, ready? What? Oh, y'all got, hey, you got something. That's good. It is a burial spice. All right, last one. I love this one. What is a heavenly host? A heavenly host. Is this the angels who serve refreshments in heaven? A. Is it a huge angel choir? Is it a angel army or none of the above? A, refreshments, B, choir, C, army, D, none of the above. What do you think? It is C, an angel army. And out, throughout the scriptures, when the heavenly host showed up, it was not good for the enemies of God because these is an army of angels. In fact, I read one of the neatest things from some uh, old, old, you know, ancient guy from the Middle Ages that had the personal belief. And when he, I read this, I thought, wow, that's awesome. His belief was that on Jesus' birthday for those shepherds, it was such a momentous occasion, God just sent all the angels. <laughs> And when the shepherds saw the angels, it was like, that's all they could see was this massive array of angels, the stars being blotted out because this occasion was so important in, in history and so precious that God the Son is taking on flesh. God just sends all the angels. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but we'll find out one day. Hey, okay, the reason why I bring all that up is, you know, there's all kinds of Christmas myths that have arisen from us. We kind of, you know, read into the scriptures, uh, you know, we don't, uh, or we just are influenced by, you know, movies and songs. I mean, some of our graphics this morning had, th this evening had three wise men on there, right? It just, just it becomes part of the tradition, and, and yet we don't know if some of these elements are actually accurate or not. And so I thought what would be good for us to do this evening and the time that we have is to, to make sure that we cover some things that we absolutely do know that are very important facts. They aren't myths. The first one, for example, has to do with the fact that out of all the people in the world, only Jesus fulfills the numerous messianic prophecies and promises that God gave to his people over the centuries. You, you go all the way back to the opening pages of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, after our ancestral parents sin and they rebel against God. In the garden, as God is pronouncing the consequences of that sin, he says that he gives a promise, a prophecy, to actually against the devil. He says to him in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. This is the first promise and prophecy we're given in the Bible that there would come a time where a special redeemer would be sent to make all things right. And as you go through the Old Testament scriptures over and over, God through his prophets leaves us with prophecies. If you don't know what a prophecy is, think of it like this. Let's say that you were given the task of predicting who, uh, where the president was going to be born who would begin office in 2,444. And, and you were told, predict that city. Okay, and you make that prediction. What do you think the chances are you're going to get that right? Okay. But this is what we're dealing with in the Bible. We have predictions that were given 
hundreds and even thousands of years before the actual event, and they all come exactly true with Jesus. So, for example, in 1000 BC, 800 years before the Romans begin to crucify people, David prophesies in the book of Psalms that his ancestor, who would be the ultimate eternal king, would have his hands and his feet pierced. Crucifixion. In 500 BC, the prophet is given the insight from God that the Messiah would ultimately be betrayed by a close friend for 30 pieces of silver. And of course, we know that that happens with who? Judas Iscariot. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises to David, he says, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And in the Luke chapter 1, when Gabriel comes and announces to Mary that she is going to conceive through the Holy Spirit a special child, Christ the Lord, he tells her he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, there will be no end prophecy fulfilled. But then you get even more specific. So for example, in uh, there's a couple of main prophecies dealing with Jesus's birth in Luke, or excuse me, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we're told 700 years before Jesus is born, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And then in Malachi, or excuse me, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we're told this. Remember that assignment? Predict where the president's going to be born? Well, out of all of the villages, all of the cities, all the places in the entire world, we find 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the man of God given the insight from God that the Messiah will be born where? O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth from me, one who's to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. These prophecies are important. They, they tell us something important. You know, there was a, a mathematician, head of a, a math department in a university out in California, math and aeronautics, who, who did a, a long-term uh, work project on figuring out probabilities in the Bible. And he and students and others worked on this project for many years, submitted it as a paper and ultimately as a book that was verified by different organizations. And, and in this book, he makes the point of what are the odds that these things would come true? Because in the Bible, there are 300, a little more than 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah, all of which you can see Jesus fulfills to the letter. And so he said, what are the odds that this could happen? And and they, they took, they just said, how about just one, you know, of, of those? And then they said, how about eight? The, the eight is fascinating. They said, they took just eight, say eight prophecies. That what are the probability, the odds that one person could fulfill eight of these prophecies, the same person? And they came out with the answer. It was uh, 10 to the 17th power. 10 with 17 zeros. That's a lot. Um, let, me, let me put it out in perspective for you. If you, uh, if you put a piece of paper with an X on it and 10 of them in a basket and you blindfolded somebody, j Path, what are the odds that, that man would pick the X? Well, one in 10, right? Okay, for us, you know, lower guys, one in 10, roughly. All right, what if you took 10 to the 17th? What were those odds? What would that look like? It looked like this. Take silver dollars. Cover the state of Texas in silver dollars. Two foot, two foot of silver dollars covering all of the state of Texas. And one of those silver dollars has an X on it. You mix all of those silver dollars up, and then you send Stephen Segre Lewis out from Dallas, and you say, Stephen, you can walk whatever direction as far as you want, but you get one choice, one choice, and to choose a silver dollar, and the odds of him picking the X are 10 to the 17th power, okay? That's how astronomically impossible it is for one person just to fulfill eight, much less 300. How is it possible that Jesus could fulfill all of these promises and prophecies? Because he is God in the flesh, fulfilling God's plan. That's why. Fact, not fiction, not myth. 
It's not a myth. It's fact. And so this leads us to a second Christmas fact, something that I hope all of you would know this evening. The announcement of Jesus' birth is the greatest proclamation in human history. Uh, Dylan and Lily read the story for us a few moments ago from Luke chapter 2. And if you didn't pick it up, that story is telling us something incredibly important, that each and every one of us needs a Savior. Why did God send a Savior? Because we need a Savior. We need a Savior because the Scriptures tell us that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's perspective on us and our natural state. Now, we don't see ourselves this way, but this is how our Creator sees us. He says, there is no one who is righteous, no, not one. In other words, it is impossible for us to do anything that is righteous before God that earns credit with Him, that measures up to His standard of holiness. We need a Savior from outside of ourselves to help and deliver us because all of us are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. And so as a result of that, the scriptures tell us that the wages of that sin is eternal separation from God. It's impossible for us to atone for our unrighteousness. And so when the angel says, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That is absolutely the greatest proclamation ever made in human history not fiction. God the Son, the eternal God, became a baby, took on human flesh. And that leads us to the last fact that I want us to think about this evening. The humiliation of Jesus at his birth illustrates the depth of his love for us. They went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. You ever thought about what those hygienic conditions were like? Think about that for a moment. Here is the creator of the universe, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, who's now taken on human flesh. He leaves the glories of heaven, the majesty of heaven, where the archangels themselves and the seraphims and the cherubim sing glory to him around the clock and had been doing so for eternity. He leaves all of the splendor and glory of heaven to be born in a place that smells like cow dung. Lying in a feeding trough. That's what a manger is, where the animals ate. That's his first bed. And he's born to a little teenage girl who's about 14 years old or so, probably scared out of her mind. He has no angels singing his praises, no attendants, no anything that we would think of as the accoutrements of the most powerful God the only God, and yet there he is. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? He tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave the greatest gift ever given, fact, not myth or fiction, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And so my question for you this evening is simply this. This fact of Jesus, this gift that God has given, have you received him as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you worship him throughout the year because he is that real to you? Or is he just somebody that you, you know a lot about because you've watched a couple of Disney specials when you were a kid or you had some stories read to you? Jesus is more than a Disney special. Jesus is God in the flesh who came to take away the sins of the world. I hope that you know him as your Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming, bearing the weight of our sins so that we could have eternal life. And we pray during this Christmas season that we would remember who you are and what you've done. And for the one who maybe is here this evening, who's come to enjoy this service to celebrate Christmas, may you open their eyes if they've not been opened yet to the reality of who you are, Lord Jesus. Would you help them to see that this is not a season of just shopping and 
celebration, something that has been developed through corporate America. This is a celebration of you, our creator, who's taken on human flesh so that we could have our sins forgiven. Without your incarnation, without your birth in Bethlehem, we would have no hope for the forgiveness of sins. And so we thank you and we sing our praises to you this evening. In your name we pray, amen.